Okay, Year 6, we're going to read the story today of Shackleton's journey. Yesterday we asked you to look at the cover and see what you could notice about the cover. So a few of you noticed the colours. And again, like I said on this way, a brilliant observation because of course the blue that you were noticing was the colour of the ocean. And some of you noticed that there were patterns with animals, sea animals and people and also um, lifeboats. Once again, really good observations because of course Shackleton's journey was about the ex expedition that Sir Ernest Shackleton took to try and venture as being one of the first people to venture to the Antarctica. So let's open up our story and have a look at the contents page. As you know, it's really important when reading a story to actually go through the contents page. The contents will tell you exactly what's in this book and what's in the story. So the contents in this story starts from the funding and recruitment. Now, of course, recruitment means the hiring of the crew. So Sir Shackleton had to actually go out and get funding before he could leave on his journey, and he had to recruit, recruit the crew. So going down the contents page, you can see there's at least 65 parts to this book. We're going to go through today and only read up until setting sail, which is only up until page 13. So today we're going to read through and have a look at the funding and the recruitment, the crew, the dogs, obviously a big point of the story, endurance, equipment and supplies, and just about ready to set sail on this expedition. So let's have a look at the introduction. Now we know a little bit already about Sir Ernest Shackleton um, after doing a biography and a waggle on him last week and also the interview with our very own Sir Ernest who came in and did a hot seating video with us. So the introduction, born on the 15th of February in 1874, Shackleton was the second of 10 children as we already know. From a young age, Shackleton complained about the teachers, but he had a keen interest in books, especially poetry. Years later on expeditions, he would read to his crew to lift their spirits. Always restless, the young Ernest left school at 16 to go off and join the merchant uh, uh, navy to go to sea. After working his way up the ranks, he told his friends, I think I can do something better. I want to make a name for myself. Shackleton was a member of Captain Scott's famous Discovery Expedition in 1901 to 1904 and told the reporters that he had always been strangely drawn to the mysterious self and that, and that unexplored parts of the world held a strong fascination for me from earliest memories. Once a Mudson had reached the South Pole ahead of Scott, Shackleton realised that there was only one great challenge left. He wrote, The first crossing of the Antarctic continent from sea to sea via the Pole, apart from its, its, its historic value, will be a journey of great significant importance. So obviously Sir Ernest wanted to be the one to achieve that. On the 8th of August 1914, Ernest Shackleton and his brave crew set out to cross the vast South Polar continent of Antarctica. Shackleton's epic journey would be the last expedition of the heroic age of the Antarctic exploration from 1888 to 1914. His story is one fraught with unimaginable peril, adventure and above all, endurance. So there are a few words in there, Year 6, that we'd like you to look up after we finish reading this story and see if you can work out what this part of the story is actually telling you, especially words like fraught, unimaginable, peril and endurance. See if you can note them down for SPAG today. It's already sounding like a real life adventure story, isn't it, Year 6? So first, Erna Shackleton had to look into funding and recruitment. The Shackletons had moved house many times from Athy in County Kildare, Ireland to Yorkshire to London. Just before Shackleton left for the Antarctica again in 1914, he lived in Kensington in West London. You can see above, above those words are a picture of what West London must have looked like at that time. 
We know today it's far more crowded than it was back then. Shackleton's first challenge was to raise enough money to support the expedition, and this proved very difficult. However, after much effort, he was able to secure the thousands of pounds that he needed. Lifeboats were named after the sponsors, the James Card, the Dudley Docker, and the Stancombe Wills. So all three of those people put a lot of money into sponsoring Sir Ernest on his journey. During the recruitment process, Shackleton quizzed candidates on their practical skills, but also more about unusual things, like if they could sing well. I wonder why that is. I wonder why Sir Ernest wanted to know if they could sing well. Have a think about that as we read on. Second in command on the ship, Frank Wilde, helped Shackleton to choose 26 men from the 5,000 that applied. Imagine that, 5,000 people applying to be a part of Sir Ernest Shackleton's crew. Aha, the crew. Now this is where it becomes exciting, Year 6, because take a good look at the crew that finally got the position after being interviewed after 5,000 had applied. Now these people, all these men that actually got the job, must have been able to do something extra, not just good at their actual job of, upon a ship, but also things like singing, perhaps they played an instrument, all the things that we were wondering about earlier. So let's take a look at them. We had Frank Worsley, who was the ship's captain. We have, of course, Erna Shackleton, who's the expedition leader. Frank Wilde, who's the second in command. Leonard Hussey, who's an expedition meteorologist. Have a look and find, see if you can find out what that word means, meteorologist. George Marsden, who's the expedition artist. There we go, somebody else who's got a, a really good skill to have there. Wonder why, have a think about why Ernest Shackleton might have wanted an, an artist aboard the ship. Walter Howe, an able seaman. Reginald James, an expedition psychiatrist. Uh, Physicist. Have a look up. Uh, have a look and see if you can find out what the word physicist means. Thomas Ord Lees, a motor expert and storekeeper. Now, why do you think a ship in those de days would need a motor expert? See if you can find out. John Vincent, who's a boats a boatswain and an able seaman. Tom Cream, who's a second officer. William Stevenson who's a fireman and the stoker. Think about it again, a fireman and a stoker. What do we know about ships that sailed in the early 20th century? How were they powered? What do you think this fireman and stoker might have had to do? We have Robert Clark, the expedition biologist. What type of science is biology? And what is an, as a biologist? James Wordy an expedition geologist. Again, geologist. Have a think about it. See if you can look it up in your dictionaries during spare time and see if you can come up with an answer. Timothy McCarthy, who's an able seaman. Alfred Cheatham, third officer. Frank Hurley, expedition photographer. Wonder why they need a photographer. And have a look at that that camera that he's got there. It's a little bit different from your phone cameras that you have today. Dr. James McIlroy, who's a second surgeon. Do you think they might need a doctor on board? Dr. Alex Alexander Macklin, who's the expedition surgeon. So not just one, but they had to have two surgeons on board. Why do you think that's the case? Is it not just enough having one surgeon? See if you can figure out why. Lionel Greenstreet, who's a first officer. Ernest Holness, an able seaman and a stoker. The word stoker. Obviously, he's holding a shovel in his hand. What do you think he needs the shovel for? Hubert Hudson, a navigating officer. Charles Green, the ship's cook. Always important to have a cook. Alexander Kerr, a second engineer. Louis Rickinson, Chief Engineer, Thomas McLeod, Able Seaman, 
Henry McNeish, the ship's carpenter, and William Bakewell Percy Blackborrow, who was an able seaman, but he was also a stowaway. Now we'll be learning a little bit more about him when we talk, talk to Sir Ernest in our interview a bit later. So year six, you have all these crew that made it through from the range of 5,000 that applied for the job. Really choose one to really study up on and you'll find out why a bit later. So find one that you think you might be interested in. Find out exactly what they might have had to do aboard the ship. And this is the page that I particularly love, the dogs. Why do you think that Sir Ernest wanted to take so many dogs aboard his ship? Let's see if we can find out why. In 1914, a cargo of 99 dogs was sent from Canada to London. Of these 99 dogs, 69 of them were chosen for the expedition. Shackleton and the crew gave them all names, and you may notice that some of them are named after famous people and crew members. So the dogs came from a mongrel mixture of breeds, including Newfoundlands, St. Bernards, Eskimo dogs, wolfhounds and wolves. Crossbreeding the dogs meant that they were very strong and had qualities that were needed, such as a very thick coat or a good temperament. And the average weight of each dog was 100 pounds. So these dogs were specially bred to be very big dogs, very strong dogs, have very thick coats. Think about where they're going. They're crossing the Antarctica. So in other words, they're going to need to be very strong, very thick coated and very, very large animals. The dogs included Alti, Amundsen, Blackie, Bob, Bosun, Bristol, Brownie, Buller, Bummer, Caruso, Chips, Dismal, Elliot, Fluff, Bruce, Hackenschmidt, Hercules, Jamie, Jasper, Jerry, Judge, Luke, Lukoid, Matt, Martin, Mercury, Noel, Paddy, Peter, Roger, Roy, Rufus, Rugby, Sadie, Sailor, Saint, Sally, Sammy, Samson, Sandy, Satan, Shakespeare, Sidelights, oh, it's a funny name for a dog, Sidelights, Simeon, Slippery Neck, Slobbers, Snowball, Soldier, Songster, Sooty, Spider, Split Up, Spotty, Steamer, Stuart, Stumps, Sub, Sue, Surly, Swanker, Sweep, Tim, Upton, Wallaby and Wolf. The lively dogs were to play a vital role in Shackleton's expedition. Their ability to pull more their weight, brave the cold and work in packs meant that they were at home in the Antarctic conditions. They were expected to cover up to 20 miles a day with a loaded sledge. So that's why guys, they had to be specially bred to be, to be strong. As you can see in the picture, they've got to pull weights upon the sledge. They have to be thick coated so that they would hold against the snow and the conditions, weather conditions. And they had to be really, really good pulling animals. Each crew member was assigned at least one dog to care for, and many developed strong bonds with them, especially second-in-command Frank Wilde, Tom Green, and the photographer Frank Hurley. They especially loved their dogs. I thought it was quite nice when I read, the, read about the expedition that each of the crew members looked after a dog each. It gave them a companion as well, and it gave the dog someone that would look, look after them, especially for them. Okay, now we come to the ship, the wonderful ship that has made made history as being one of the most famous ships by a European explorer or discoverer. The ship was named the Endurance and originally intended for tourist cruises and polar hunting. The Endurance, Endurance or Polaris, as she was initially named, was perhaps the strongest wooden vessel in the world, with the exception of the Fram. She was named after Shackleton's family motto, By Endurance We Conquer. I'd like you to have a think about that motto and see if you can figure out what it actually means. Think about the word endurance and think about the word conquer. Find out the definitions of each and perhaps you can tell us what that motto might be saying. Endurance was designed by Ollie Aldred Larson. 
and constructed under the watch of master shipbuilder Christian Jacobson at the Framnines shipyard in Sandefjord, Norway. Jacobson, being a meticulous, meticulous craftsman, made sure that all men who worked on the ship's construction were experienced seafarers as well as skilled shipwrights. One of the main differences between the Endurance and the Fram was that the Fram was bowl-bottomed, allowing her to rise out of the ice if she became stuck. Luckily for Shackleton, the original owners at Adrian de Gerlach and Lars Christensen were in financial straits and desperate to sell the ship. Being supportive of Shackleton's intentions, they were happy to sell the endurance for £11,600. Today, that would work out at approximately £45,000, a fraction of the original cost. Being such a unique ship, endurance had to be worked on with a whole host of conventional and unconventional carpentry tools. Endurance was built from Norwegian fir, oak, and green heart. A very robust and sturdy little ship, the Endurance was specifically designed to withstand harsh polar conditions. This meant that when it, wherever possible, joints and fittings were cross-braced and strengthened, making her extremely strong. Later on, a platform was rigged under the jib boom so that Hurley was able to film the ship breaking through the pack ice. The bow, the front, would be used like a battering ram to break up the thick ice so it had to be especially strong. In total, it was 1.3 metres thick. Each piece of timber had to be selected carefully from a single oak tree so that it would fit the design and curvature of the ship. Her keel was made up of four sandwich pieces of solid oak, totaling to a thickness of nearly 2.2 metres, while both her sides were 0 0.7 metres thick. She was an incredibly strong ship and designed to battle the thick ice of the Antarctica. As you know, Year 6, we generally talk about ships and as a person, we call this personification, as some of you may remember. And usually, ships are actually called a she. We personify them as a female. I'm not sure why that is, but it is generally the case. Equipment and supplies. As well as supporting a crew of 28 men and 69 dogs, Endurance carried a large amount of cargo. Journeying into the heart of the Antarctica meant that Shackleton would need to carry a whole array of exploration equipment and supplies to keep him and his crew alive in hostile conditions, from sledges and skis to blankets and mitts. Just before the departure, Shackleton was presented with the Union flag by King George V, who encouraged him to bring it back safely. We're actually going to go through a lot of this with Sir Ernest himself in the interview that follows in the in the um, video below. So I haven't explained a lot about the supplies and I haven't explained a lot about the building of the ship because much of that is going to come when you listen to the interview that, that I was lucky enough to have with our very own Sir Ernest Shackleton. So we've seen the start of the book now, Year 6, okay? And we're going to follow on listening to the interview and then we'll get to the next part.